It's uh, always a privilege to be able to bring God's word and for us to reflect on and to take away. I hope for you, as it is for me, uh, that it's never just a, a one-off thing in church and you go away and forget about it, but that there are things that God will impress during the time of the service and during the scripture and the unfolding of that. Um, that we can carry with us and I trust that so this morning I've been asked to speak from Psalm 33 and it was like why Psalm 33 now I need to say to you we're out of sequence a little bit David last week was Psalm 1 Gary was to speak to David I need to be elsewhere so next week so Gary next week we'll go to Psalm 23 <laughs> the really rich experience to unpack that one we jump 10 to 33 and somebody else will do 43 I think it is later on so hey um, that's where we're going this morning before I actually commence can I just say to you quickly uh, again tonight with the Sweet Sorrows concert it's an opportunity just to relax together bring a friend and it's like an opportunity to, to connect with Christian people and share some fun, some insight. There'll be some thoughts on the way in Sammy and Kylie's own unique way that will be helpful for us. And just on Tuesday, oh, that is also in the garage. So walk down the driveway. It's the easiest way. And for those who are not as mobile, it's a bit easier that way. Tuesday night, uh, they will be with us in our home group and uh, at our home. If you would like to be present that night, you're welcome to come, okay? Tuesday night, 7.30. So, we're going to read from Psalm 33, and I've asked if uh, Peter Cosgrove will come and join with me in that. Um, check that your voice is working there. Testing. Oh, testing, sorry. Testing, testing. Not on? Yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, speaker. Oh, I'm oh, great. Sorry. It's on now. That's better? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. All right. Now, before we do that, this is one of those awesome passages of Scripture that really embraces a whole raft of biblical truth. In many countries, including ours, often when there is something that is important, or if you like, a, maybe a suitable dignitary, we stand in acknowledgement. And I'm going to invite you this morning as we read the scriptures, Peter and I will alternate in the sections of this passage. We're reading it together. Would you like to stand? Again, recognising the significance of what we're reading. Let's stand together. Psalm 33. Let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. It is fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with melodies on the lyre. Make music for him on the ten-stringed harp. Sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. For the word of the Lord holds true and everything he does is worthy of our trust. He loves whatever is just and good, and his unfailing love fills the earth. The Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. He breathed the word, and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries, and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole earth fear or revere the Lord. Let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. The Lord shatters the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes, but the Lord's plans stand forever 
firm. His intentions can never be shaken. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people he has chosen for his own. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts, so he understands everything they do. The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor is great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on war horse, on your war horse to give you victory, for all its strength it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him and those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and he keeps them alive in times of famine. And this is the response. We put our hope in the Lord. Actually, let's read it together. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Thank you, Sarah. Let's pray. Father, as we endeavour to unpack this passage of Scripture, uh, help us to glimpse something of your greatness. And as it mentions three times in this passage, your unfailing love that we might carry away into a world and a week in which we need you. We thank you again for what this passage says to us and help us in some way to grasp the enormity of it, I pray in Jesus' name. So let me ask you a question. Why do we come to church? Uh, if you were to make a one sentence statement, I wonder what your response would be. Most people would say something on the lines of, um, we come to honour God. We do that as we share together in fellowship. Um, as we learn from the scriptures, from our Bible, uh, as we're praying, as we're giving our offering, as we share in a time of communion, as we sing praise to God. But whatever we do, and whatever you, and however you might respond to that question, the focus needs to be about the Lord, about God. Now, sometimes I think we lose that focus. In fact, uh, years ago, President Grant, Ulysses Grant from the USA, went to Scotland and a Scottish notable person wanted to introduce him to the game of golf. And uh, it was arranged that this guy would get with the president, they go to the golf course, and the guy put the the ball, the golf ball on the tee and he addressed the ball and he took one almighty swing and just blasted sand everywhere. He missed the ball. So again he addresses the tee and he takes a swing and he blasts sand, as it said, sand that went all over the president's beard. And that's happened six times in a row without hitting the ball. He, he, he missed it completely. And the president was patient through it all, and then he said, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in this game, but I fail to see the purpose of the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. 
Now, obviously, the ball is important in golf, isn't it? You're not getting anywhere if, if you don't actually make connection and do something with that ball. The ball is central. You miss it, and it's pointless, the whole thing. And that can be the very thing about our coming to the lights of church or our Christian experience day by day. That God is to be the centre of our whole life and the one whom we worship. I mean, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Fix your eyes upon Jesus. That literally means focus, concentrate on him. Why? Because he is now and the enduring one through all eternity. And in Psalm 33, verses 1 to 4, it actually talks about centering our thoughts and focusing on the presence of Jesus. It's like a celebration of God. It's like, let the godly sing for joy to the Lord. You know, that's something that's pretty unique to the Christian church. There are not a lot of places where people sing. They do at the soccer and sometimes at concerts. But generally speaking, that's not often happening in groups of people. In fact, the early Christians were known as people who would rise at dawn to sing praise to God. That's recorded in a comment to the emperor of Rome at the time. Psalm 33 instructs us to worship God. Let the godly sing praise to God. The psalmist is making it clear our focus is to be on God. Who he is, his characteristic, his very being. It's not about us and what we want God to do. It's not about what we want from God. It's not about how God impacts us. That's not what praise is talking about. It is totally focused on who God is and his characteristics and his actions. And that's something that we've lost sight of in the church. Very often, many of the songs we sing are about us and our experience of God. And that's fine, but let's not call that praise and worship of God. That's in fact selfish. It's talking about me and what God has done for me. So William Temple really summed things up years ago when he wrote about worship in these words. To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God and to devote the will to the purpose of God. Do you notice something there? It's all about God. It's nothing to do with us, in essence. It comes from us and in our focus, looking to and seeing God in the process of all that takes place. So we might ask the question legitimately, why this focus? Why is this instruction here to worship, to focus upon God. And so progressively through these verses, and if you noted when Peter and I were reading, there are different phases, there are different attributes that are there that help us to focus and to shape our th th thoughts. And the first is that God is faithful. I don't know whether you were listening or you actually registered anyway, when Vicky started the service this morning, she started, and one of the attributes of God was talking about his faithfulness. Luani, in her talk with the kids, did the same thing. God is faithful. And it's significant for us to actually to tap into that, to remember that his faithfulness impacts our lives today, not just back there centuries ago. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you remember something that happened three weeks ago? You might remember some, but hey, three weeks ago it was Christmas. Right? Come, gone, dusted, passed, right? Finished, over and done with that. No. 
Christmas is an evidence of God's faithfulness and goodness. Why do I say that? Let me run this by you just for a moment to think about. The birth of Jesus was foretold over 300 times. Most commentators say somewhere in the vicinity of 330 or even up to 345 times in the Old Testament. So what? When Jesus was born, there were three great continents at the time. There was Europe, Africa and Asia Minor. The Old Testament writers indicated that Jesus would be born in what was then Asia Minor. Now in Asia Minor, there were many countries. There are about nine or ten at least that we know of. It's like Syria, Phoenicia, Bithynia, Palestine, Cappadocia, and there are many more. And the Old Testament writers, they actually said Jesus would be born in Palestine. Now in Palestine, there were three provinces or states, if you like. Judea, Samaria and Galilee. And the Old Testament writers said he would be born in, Ga in Judea. In Judea there were hundreds, if not thousands, of little villages, often not more than ten homes. And the Old Testament writer says Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, a Praphrata, in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Yeah. For years I used to think to myself, well, so what? what? What's that about? There are two Bethlehems, one to the north, one to the south of Jerusalem. And the Old Testament writers are being very specific in saying, as God directed them, that Jesus would be born in a certain place. Now, A French mathematician looked at the chances of 40 of those prophecies about Jesus being fulfilled. If 40 of them. And he came to the conclusion that how you do this, I don't know. It's beyond me. But it's one, the chances of that happening are one to the power of 157, which means one with 157 zeros following. The chances of 40 of those prophecies being fulfilled. It's like, really? Wow! So, why do we remember pretty much worldwide, in some shape or form, the birth of Jesus? We don't think of Captain Cook and celebrate. Maybe Napoleon or Caesar or the Prime Minister of Australia and even the King or the Queen of the Commonwealth only gets the Commonwealth to sell. Why? There is somehow something unique and God is faithful in fulfilling his promises. In fact, even more so when you stop to think about it, it says in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, at just the right time Jesus was born. You think, hey, what's that about? At just the right time. At just the right time when the Greeks had contributed by Alexander the Great that he conquered the world and Greek was the universal language. And it is so specific, it is very helpful for us as we study the Bible. You know, there are four words, for example, about love. So I say I love my wife and I love cricket and I love ice cream. They're very different words that are used. So we can be specific in our understanding and knowledge of that. That is helpful for the communication of the Christian message. And then there was the Roman Empire and the contribute, contribution that they brought was the whole communications network of roads and sea lanes never before previously experienced up until that point of time. So the communication transmission of the gospel, the good news of Jesus, would be transmitted so easily and readily. And then the Jewish people, as they scattered throughout the world, they always had a centre of worship. They developed, and once they had sufficient numbers, a synagogue. And if you follow the history of the Acts and beyond, 
after the resurrection of Jesus and the church beginning to spread, they first went as a strategy to those who were sympathetic, Judaizers, if you like, into the synagogues and then into the village or the town or the city around that at just the right time. You see, here God was at work. He is faithful to bring about his purposes and his promises. And we can conclude that what God says he does, what he promises he fulfills. We've got to move on. Why do we praise God? Firstly, because he's faithful. Secondly, this passage is saying, why should we worship God? Because he is creator. Verses 6 through to 9. God merely spoke. And the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the seas its boundaries and blocked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Oh, let the whole earth revere, fear, stand in awe of the Lord. Let everybody stand in awe before him. Bavani touched on that in talking with the kids. What is it, for example, about creation that really helps you in your opening up of your heart and your life? Some of us, we like to go walk, walk in the bush and take photographs. Others will go down by the beach. Others will look at a mountain and just be blown away. Right? God created by his word. What's that say? He spoke and it was. That's the greatness of our God. Now, let me just give you one little insight if you'd like. Uh, in New Zealand and in Tasmania, you can actually, and Alice and I have had the, the joy and the privilege of, of seeing royal albatross. Birds with a massive wingspan, right? They can travel 900 kilometres with less than a flap of wings and certainly less flapping than it takes for a sparrow to cross the road. Over 900 kilometres, one or two flaps is enough. The albatross has a small wind speed recorder in its beak or its bill. And it sends data to the brain and it allows the bird to make wind or wing adjustments according to the wind conditions. Now, that's, that's whilst the bird is asleep. Often for those 900 kilometres that apply, it can be asleep that whole time. And so it has this sensor, it sends messages to the brain and adjusts the wings so that it keeps on flying. You know it has an inbuilt desalination plant. <laughs> we often think our governments would do well to think to copy it. It scoops up seawater in its bill and a series of tubes and membranes in its bill actually process the water and it extrudes the salt so that there is enough salt left in the water that the bird actually needs, but not too much. And the psalmist is saying, think about that. It's like, wow, God created. How good is that? And then it goes on and says, okay, praise God because he's faithful. Praise God because he is the creator. Praise God because he is powerful. And I'm going to put the two together, points three and four, just for brevity's sake, believe it or not. <laughs> he is powerful and it's futile to ignore God. Look at verse 13. The Lord looks down from heaven and he sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts, so he understands everything they do. 
The best equipped army cannot save a king, nor a great strength enough to save a warrior. Don't count on your war horse to give you victory for all its strength that cannot save you. But, contrast, but the Lord watches over those who fear him and those who rely on his unfailing love. My friends, will you take hold of that phrase that there in verse 18 and in verse 5 and in verse 23, God's unfailing love. It's like the Psalms are saying, you can do the dumbest of things. You can do the most outrageous things. You can fail miserably. But God's unfailing love will never change. How good is that? His power is without limit. His ability, there is no end. And it's like no king is saved by his army. <laughs> Do you know, Napoleon once wrote, as recorded in history, um, he said, who has the heaviest of artillery wins? You know, the Battle of Waterloo, the British had 150 guns and Napoleon 260, and he was defeated. He was wrong. And he's just backing up exactly what the scripture says here, literally. It doesn't matter about the might and the power and what you seem to be up against. Whether it's in the spiritual realm with Satan as the enemy or whether it's in the physical circumstances of life. It's like saying God is supreme. And so you go to 2 Kings 6 and 7 or 2 Kings 19 and you see the amazing incidents in which God intervened. Go to 2 Kings chapter 19 and here's this huge army that's besieged Jerusalem. It's identified in secular history. It's not just a story, as some people say, in the Bible. And it, Sennacherib has actually surrounded the city, isolated it, and threatening that he's going to invade and just demolish the city of Jerusalem. And King Hezekiah gets a dirty note from Sennacherib and says, don't think your God is going to help you. My God is greater. Right? And what does King Hezekiah do? He doesn't marshal up some allies. He doesn't marshal his troops. He goes to the temple of God, spreads out the letter, and he says, God, what am I to do? Right there is a principle for us. Do we do that when stuff's coming down in our lives? And as he prays, suddenly... Isaiah the prophet arrived. He said, I've got a message from you. And he said, he will not enter the city. I will defend the city, says God. But, right. Next night, the angel of the Lord visited the camp. And the next morning, you go out, and Sennacherib and his mom have taken off. Now, God is powerful. That's back there in history. I wish I had time to actually replay a program. One of the programs I record every Sunday morning is uh, The Indescribable Journey. Uh, last Sunday, it was a lady who was taken um, or hijacked, captive, by a murderer. A guy had escaped. He'd been on serious charges. Um, in court, he'd killed the judge and a number of other law officials. And he'd kidnapped this lady. And she talks about the process. As a lady who was struggling with her Christian faith and a very rough journey and, and difficult times, but how God was present in that encounter with this bloke and she was free. God still works. 
not always in the dramatic stuff like that. But who does God work on behalf of? If you look at it, it says here in the scriptures, those whose hope is in the Lord, those who trust and those who seek him. So verse 19 says to us and sort of reminds us again, the eyes of the Lord upon those who fear him, who are in awe of him and who rely on his unfailing love. So what's our focus? That's really what the psalmist is saying here. Think about this great God. He's faithful. He's creator. He's powerful. He's at work in our universe. What's our focus? We know, for example, in science that Every couple of years, there are new things that come about. Technology is changing. It is said every five years in the IT world. But 4,000 years after this Old Testament was written, 2,000 years after the time of Jesus, the Bible is still transforming people by the message of the Christ. And still today, we worship him. But what's our focus? Do we allow our lives to be influenced and shaped? Now, I was reading Max Licardo just recently, and Max Licardo talked about a flight, an aircraft flight that he was on, and uh, they were experiencing severe um, turbulence. And he said it was really quite alarming and scary. But in the middle of it, there was this, it was like uncontrollable laughter. Um, there were just outbursts of one bloke laughing his head off. And he sort of puzzled the, the passengers around him. And Max Ricardo says, after a while, it almost got on his nerves. And he, he sort of half sat up in his seat, looked around, and he could see this bloke he had earphones on. And when he talked with the bloke a little bit later, he said, oh yeah, I was listening to a comedian. <laughs> Question, who do you listen to? Mom. What do we allow our thoughts to centre on changes literally our actions and our responses? Because he could hear something totally different, totally different to what Max Licardo could hear. He acted differently. And that's the question that comes to us as we read this psalm. It's like, what are our responses going to be to this faithful, creator, all-powerful God? Are we going to listen to him? Are we going to give attention to what he is saying? Here's a lady... Just average citizen. Connie was a mum um, in the mid 50s, grandma. Um, husband was soon to retire and things were okay. They enjoyed life. They travelled overseas and then she was given the news that she had cancer, a brain tumour. And she remained calm as she had previously. It's like she'd learned to be calm. And as a Christian lady, her practices were that she would pray and read the scriptures and allow God's input into her life each day. And she got that news and people around her said, aren't you worried? Aren't you anxious? Aren't you getting uptight of it? She said, I don't like it. I don't want it. But I know God knows. And in the midst of that uncertainty and struggle, she was evidencing that her focus was in a different place. She learnt the secret that the Apostle Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 4. You know in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11, he says, I have learned 
the secret. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. But I have learned the secret of being contented in any and every circumstance. Whether I'm hungry or not. Whether life's good or not. So what's the secret? That I can do all things through Christ. It's coming back to the focus. It's coming back, if you will, to worship, to centre our life and our thoughts upon who and what God is. And so this morning, we are actually invited to make a response. And in a moment, we're going to share in communion. The table behind you, you're invited to move to take the elements that remind us of the death of Jesus. The bread, speaking of his body, that was busted up. The cup, the juice, symbol of the blood that Jesus gave. He chose to give it for us. And it's like we come and we say, wow, thank you. I give my life again to you in response but come back to the psalm look at these last words as it finishes up and in verse 20 the psalmist says come together folks make the statement we put our hope in the Lord he is our help and our shield in, in him our hearts rejoice choice in him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, because our hope is in you alone. Now, I'm going to invite you. Read those words together now, aloud, as a prayer, as a response to God. A God who is faithful, a God who loves unfailingly, a God who is powerful, a God who continues to be at work within our lives and he is the creator God and we say, Lord, I'm coming to you and I trust as I take these communion elements, this is my heart. We put our hope in you. In him our hearts rejoice. Let your unfailing love surround us. So, I'm going to ask you again. Would you stand? If you're able to stand, do that and be, be comfortable. Okay, if you can't. But read those words. Let's read them as our response this morning, as our prayer, and then move to the communion table and take the elements as you're ready. We put our trust in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Amen. Please participate in communion as you wish.